Welcome to the Touch MBA Admissions Podcast. Do you need help figuring out which schools to apply to or how to get into the world's top MBA programs? Hey, you're not alone. Join thousands of others on this podcast and on our site, touchmba.com, as they seek the admissions edge. And now, here's your host, Darren Joe. Welcome to episode 31 of the Touch MBA podcast. This is your host, Darren. And it's fitting that it's our 31st episode this week because we are going to be speaking with Lawrence Cole, who is the author of the popular MBA blog, MBA Over 30, about how he got into Wharton, Chicago Booth, and MIT Sloan as a 36-year-old. So this podcast is really for older applicants, you know, who have way more work experience than average, who are way older than average. And it's really about how older applicants can best present themselves and what booby traps older candidates should avoid in the MBA application process. So I think that there's just a ton of great advice um, in this episode. Lawrence has really lived and breathed MBA applications for the past year. And you can really hear his knowledge and experience with the application process. But before we get into this week's show, just a few quick announcements. I'll be publishing the podcast every Thursday instead of Friday. Uh, I figure Friday is the one day you have to relax and to not think about MBA applications and business schools. So be sure to check in with us every Thursday for you know a new episode, interviews with admissions directors and students uh, about how to get into your dream school. I'm also preparing the ultimate list of deadlines and starting dates for the top 100 programs. So you'll never have to research application deadlines again. Um, (laughs) You'll also be able to find out which top MBA programs have January start dates, which top MBA programs, you know, are 12, 12 months or 16 months. So be sure to check out our site this weekend for that resource. Finally, if you still need assistance selecting business schools and want to know what are the best schools you can get into, that's what we do here at Touch MBA. So go over to our site, www.touchmba.com, tell us about yourself, and we'll give you school suggestions based on your profile and also help you with admissions advice and program fit. And this is all for free. You know, over 50 candidates have signed up for this service. And we've also had six top business schools also partner with us. um, So you can get your profile evaluated by those six schools with just one click, go head over and get signed up. So on to the show. It's my pleasure today to be speaking with Lawrence Cole, who is a first year student at Wharton. Before he came to Wharton was known as MBA over 30. Um, So Lawrence had a really popular applicant blog that has gotten over 180,000 views online. So a lot of people followed his journey applying to top business schools as an older candidate. And Lawrence was successfully uh, admitted to MIT Sloan, Booth, and Wharton. So I'm sure he has a lot of uh, great tips for those of you who may be a bit older, may have a bit more work experience, and are considering going to top MBA programs around the world. So, Lawrence, I just want to welcome you to the show, and, and thank you thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, David. Lawrence, could you just tell us a bit more about your personal and professional background? Sure. So, professionally, I, um, I went to um, undergrad at Florida a and and got a bachelor's in electrical engineering back in 2000. I came out of there and I worked for a company called Earthlink, which used to be a very popular ISP back when ISP still mattered. I was a programmer for them for about eight or nine months. And then the whole dot-com explosion happened, 9-11 happened, and they kind of got rid of everyone, including myself. And I went to work for a small business after that for a couple of years and kind of learned basic online marketing and learn how to build some of the marketing processes behind an e-commerce site. I came out of that and went to went to work for UPS, first as a small business sales rep, then as an operations supervisor, an engineering supervisor, and then as an account executive. Overall, I was at that company um, about eight, eight and a half years, and I switched jobs every 
just about every other year on average. And then during that time, I also started my first business. It was an online weight loss website that I ran using some of the online marketing skills that I had. And I always had some sort of on, on, online or side business that I had in addition to my job. So I was always a person who worked full time and then ran something of my own at night. And then I left UPS in 2011 and went to a company called Internet Brands, which was probably my, my favorite job that I had. I was um, um, working in marketing and operations. I got to lead um, an international team of people from all over the world. It was very interesting work managing a team that supported um, a software brand. And out of that position, I applied to business school and ended up at Wharton and just started this fall in 2013. So let's 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 rewind and, and, and go back to when you were at V Bulletin. It was your favorite job. You're you're managing this this team around the world. You have almost a decade's right worth of experience working for, for a company like UPS as well. When did you realize you needed an MBA and, and what made you realize that? You know, that, that's really an interesting story, Darren. For, I would say, 80 to 90% of my career before I actually began studying for the GMAT, an MBA was not on my radar at all. Um, I came out of college knowing that I, I really desired to be an entrepreneur. And at that time, I was coached and told by mentors and friends of mine who are already business owners that if you wanted to run a business, then you needed to just run a business. That business school was the absolute last place that you needed to be. And so I didn't even think about an MBA. I just went into, you know, starting my own first business. And I didn't think about an MBA for years and years. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that initially I started out looking at the GMAT intending to simply help a family member who was considering going to business school. I wasn't even thinking about going to business school. And I kind of got bit by the bug and decided to go ahead and, and go for it. And so I took the GMAT. At first, I took it without studying. I don't know what I was thinking. I did very poorly. Uh, <laughs> put myself together, uh, studied for a few months, did fairly well, and um, hopped on that train and began to really pursue the MBA. And, and by this time, I had done a substantial amount of research, and I, I had found out and discovered that there was a, a significant amount of people who were now going back into business schools and that the schools themselves had been throwing a lot of money at entrepreneurship and providing a lot of support for people who had entrepreneurial aspirations. But it just simply was not the case. When I came out of undergrad, business schools did not want entrepreneurs. They were fairly blunt about that. I had read articles about it. Even though I wasn't considering an MBA at that time, I knew that it was how they thought. And so when I found out that that had completely been put on its ear, it began to intrigue me. And as I began to dig deeper and deeper into um, information that was out there, it became more and more attractive uh, from not just the entrepreneurial support aspects, but also just the entire experience that people talked about, how transformative it was, the travel, the great people that they met. And I've always longed to be in just um, a great environment of people. There, there's no other time in, uh, in anyone's life that I can think of where a group of folks have been handpicked you know, in my case, you know, 850 in my class and probably about 2,000 if you, you know, consider the, the, the second years and the faculty and the staff. These people have all been handpicked um, that are all amazing and bright from all over the world to keep me company for two years and to be people that I can learn from. Can I ask how old are you right now? <laughs> As MBA over 30, you have to tell us how old you are. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm quite over 30. I actually, um, last Summer, I turned 36. So you applied when you were 35, right? I did. Yeah. In the fall. Uh -huh. Wow. Okay. So there is this common perception in, in the MBA admissions world that because the average age of, of the programs like Booth, MIT, and Warden are, say, 28 years old is the average age, of course there's a range there, but that you kind of need to be within that range to have a good chance. So I wanted to ask you, would you have any tips uh, for candidates who have more work experience uh, than average on, on how to best position themselves? Absolutely. Well, I think first, it's really important to, to really understand why the ages skew young the way that they do in the first place. That's kind of where I started. But one thing that really helped me really was having a background in sales and marketing. And so I felt that because of that, I knew how to kind of approach finding out how I should present myself. And then that was helped from other people. 
allowed me to be able to put together an attractive package. The first thing to understand about why the agents are what they are is to understand the inner workings of two major industries, banking and consulting. These are industries where people typically work for two to four, maybe five years, and they are literally pushed out of the company to go and get an MBA if they want to move up. And because those are professions that typically are very demanding from a schedule standpoint, a lot of those companies kind of pressure the schools to give them a younger candidate because they know that pretty much by the time someone's about 30 years old or older, if they've worked a lot of hours before, they're, they're typically trying to get out of that. A lot of them are starting families and their and work-life balance is typically more important to people who are over 30. Also, um, some years ago, the top business schools began doing some research and they found out that they were losing some of the most smart women to law school and med school because they could go to those degree programs uh, right out of undergrad as opposed to business school where you are expected to work first. And so they began to skew the ages a little bit younger to capture more women and to promote more women in management. So those are really the main two reasons, plus the fact that most people at by the mid 30s just are not interested in going back to school full time. It's not a good um, gamble for them. Maybe they have a family and it's not worth the opportunity cost. Um, so there's there's not a ton of of applications coming from people in that demographic. I would bet good money that the admissions rate for people over 30 is not very different. It may actually even be higher than for those who are who are under 30. So as far as tips uh, to really get into answering your question about what I would advise someone to do. Um, the, the number one thing that schools are concerned about is that you might be a person who is trying to jumpstart a career that has failed. Mm. And to them, a, a career that has failed in the eyes of the admissions board to a, a career that has not moved. You need to show movement. You need to show that you've had different responsibilities, whether you were in the same company and you were working in different functions or you change actual companies. Personally, I don't believe in staying in a particular job, by a job, I mean, same company, same function for more than two years, three years max. I don't think I ever stayed in one any more than that with the exception of one sales position that I did stay in for about four years. So that's the biggest thing. Make sure that you're showing movement in your career because when they see a stagnated career, you know, you've been doing the exact same thing for five years, six years, seven years. That's a red flag that you haven't moved anywhere, that you may not be driven to improve yourself, and you may be passed by because of that. You also have to know that the schools, they, they, they expect more out of you as an older candidate. So if someone's coming out of school two, three years ago, and they work for Goldman Sachs, or they work for McKinsey or Deloitte, they will give that person a pass if, let's say, they've never managed people or if they haven't had that much community service because they worked, you know, 80 hour weeks. But if you've been out of school nine years, 10 years, 12 years, the way that the schools are going to see it for the most part, and I'm not trying to tell any specific per kind of person that they, that they won't get in, but I'm giving you kind of a law of averages. They're not going to be extremely understanding that in 10 or 12 years, you've never managed people before. They're not going to be very understanding that in 10 or 12 years, you have not contributed to your community. And so for me, luckily, just as a part of who I was a person, that community service element was there. Um, I did a lot of personal development with leadership programs and self-development programs. I had been in Toastmasters as a public speaker for like over a decade. I, I, was, I was doing a lot of tutoring. I, I, I did a lot in the community and I had done it consistently from the time that I got out of undergrad through the entire 12, 13 years that I worked before coming to school. So I know that that was something that they had looked at. I started businesses before, I published a book before. So whatever it is that you've done that shows that you are the kind of person that takes initiative and makes an impact wherever you go, that's what they're looking for. And the older you are, it is it can be more challenging to be able to have shown that consistently. Um, but that's really, I think, the thing that make that will make an, an older candidate stick out. They'll say, okay, you've been out much longer than these candidates that are seven 
five, maybe even 10 years younger than you, what do you have to show for that? What impact have you made? Are you the person where, whether it was in your community and the jobs that you've been in, have you made an impact? Have you been someone that is memorable and that has made a contribution? I think that advice is, is spot on. So older candidates really need to show, just to sum up what you said, movement in their careers, show that they've taken the initiative um, and show that they've made an impact in their community, whether that's you know the workplace community or, or outside the, the workplace. But what about your career goal? Because all MBA programs are gonna ask, what do you wanna do you know, after you get an MBA? And as someone who has a lot more experience, you know, would you have any tips there for candidates on, on how you presented yourself and how they can present their career goals? I do because the career goal, I'm glad you brought this up because I wasn't thinking about it, but the career goals thing, there can actually be um, quicksand for an older candidate if they don't know what they're doing. Um, so one huge trap that an older candidate needs to watch out for, um, a large portion of the people who go to get MBAs are going to be bankers and consultants. Even some that don't end up planning on that on the way in, by the time they get, you know, wine and dine by the companies and they, you know, they throw the six figure salaries at them, that's where a good portion of them will end up. And it can feel very comfortable to just say, well, oh, no, I think I want to go into consulting. I remember being at a Wharton event in Los Angeles. It was their info session that they had at the Deloitte consulting offices downtown. And there was a guy who was probably about 43. And he was talking about how he really wanted to get into investment banking and I was just shaking my head because if you can remember what I was talking about just a few minutes ago, consulting and banking, that's a young man's game or young women's game. The companies know it, the schools know it. Typically in the mid thirties is when people are getting out of those professions to slow things down a bit, to tailor their job around their life a lot more. So if you are 30, significantly over 30, I would say over 32, and you're talking about wanting to go into consulting or banking, the schools are, are very likely to pass you by because they know that that's what the companies want. They know that more than likely you may not even be, may not even be willing to take on that lifestyle. So I would definitely avoid those two professions in general. Now, what I will say is this, and this law is true for everyone, regardless of age. When you're talking about your goals, your goals, first and foremost, need to be somewhat detailed. You don't have to know everything about the actual job, but you need to have to show that you've done some research and that you're generally familiar with what companies you might work for, what functions you might work in. And here's something else. You need to be able to show the schools that that goal is realistic for you. And the way that you show them that it's realistic is you have to be able to show them that you already have some history of doing something in that, in that arena. If it wasn't professional, maybe it was a hobby, an interest that you had. Professional experience is always good. Something that lets the school know that if they give you their education and access to their, their network and their, their brand name, that you're someone who could actually make what you say you're going to make happen, happen in real life. That's really big to them. The one big exception to that, I will say, would be MIT. MIT is uh, one of those schools who is very peculiar about the way that they select people. Now, I'm not on the admissions committee, so take what I'm saying with a grain of salt, but this is what I actually was told by someone from the admissions committee, and I applied it, and it worked for me because I was able to get into that school. Uh, with some scholarship money. Well, with MIT, they really, and they say it on their website, they're really not so much interested in what you say you're going to do. And it makes sense because about 80% of the people who go into business school change when they get there. So that's the one school with a goal that they really care about, even more so, what you've done and how you contributed. But for, for most schools, when it comes to goals, you need to have show that you've done some research in the area. You need to show that it's realistic and that you have some interest in it. And I always try to tell people that I do, you know, admissions consulting with myself is to try to find something in your background that shows that you had an interest, that you had an interest in that way of thinking or, or, or in that model, maybe even way before being a professional. I mean, I was able to tell a story about, you know, me being interested in websites and e-commerce 
as a college student before I ever had a job. So it would make sense for me to be passionate about the goals that I espoused in my actual essay. So the believability is one thing that I believe a lot of people mess up, uh, but you've got to nail it. They've got to believe your story and you got to hit all the right points, I think, in order to have a shot at the top schools and differentiate yourself among your competitors. So I'll definitely link in the show notes to Lawrence's site, MBA Over 30, where, you know, if you're interested in, in working with Lawrence, you can you can sign up for his services there. But but Lawrence, um, I, I agree. I think believability is so important, especially for, you know, older candidates, because if you're an older candidate and you don't have a believable or realistic career goal post MBA, that's a real knock on, on, on your case. And um, it's funny because I just had the MIT, uh, one of their admissions directors on the show, and he said exactly what you said, that MIT really values your experience in the last three years. So they're really looking at your, your past accomplishments and, and recent accomplishments. But I think for any top business school, they do want to see, as you said, what have you done if you want to move into finance and you're in marketing? What have you done already to show your and demonstrate your interest in finance, whether that's taking the CFA exam or helping to manage your family's investments or whatever it is? They need some sort of evidence that you, know, you are interested in this field already and you're not just, you, you don't have this big dream in the sky that you haven't really thought through in terms of a career goal. Exactly. So I think that's fantastic advice for our audience. Now, in terms of researching schools, clearly, Lawrence, you've done your research on this whole process and on what schools are looking for. But how did you go about figuring out which schools to apply to? So in the very beginning, I wasn't even looking to leave the West Coast. I looked at Stanford. I looked at Berkeley. I looked at the L.A. schools, UCLA and USC. And then I quickly added MIT to that list for the obvious reasons and their reputation and entrepreneurship did not consider Harvard, did not consider Wharton, didn't really consider any of the, the, the more stalwart business schools, didn't consider Booth. Uh, it really was an evolution for me because it, there was just so much that I, that I did not realize. In the beginning, my view was skewed just by being on the West Coast. But some of it was just because there has just been such a, such a turnaround in a, in a short period of time with the degree to which schools have been focusing on, on my given area of entrepreneurship. So when it came to doing research, for me, it was important that, of course, you know, went to the website and saw what they said, but I really think that it's important just to speak with students. I looked up recent graduates that were doing what I wanted to do. I mean, I really worked hard to find as much experiential data that I could find, not so much about what the school said, but what the people who went to the school said and what the people who went to other schools said about their peer schools. I mean, I did a lot of research in that area. Um, and, and one thing that probably helped me being a little bit older is that I was lucky to have had a network of people that had been to a good number of these schools at some point. Most of my friends that were about my age from undergrad who have gone to, you know, Sloan and HBS and Wharton and Kellogg, they had done so back in like maybe 07, 08, 09. But I did have uh, one friend of mine who actually, she just graduated from Kellogg this past spring and her and I were an undergraduate together. So I was able to balance a lot of stuff off of those people. And then I just clover leafed and found more and more people to talk to. Selecting which schools you're going to apply to can be one of the toughest things because there are a good number of programs that are good. Everyone's goals are different. Um, I don't think it's necessarily necessary to apply for the top ranked business school that is out there or one of the top ranked business schools that is that are out there. Um, it's really important to find a strong school that has a, a, a top, a really strong top brand that's really good at producing people who are doing what you want to do. And for you, that may that may be a top five, it may be a top ten. It might be a top 20. It's, it, it's different for different people. That's kind of the mindset that I had when I was doing my own research on schools. Did you focus your talks on with, with students who were also interested in entrepreneurship? Or did you try to get you know, a broader view from candidates who were going into the consulting and the banking and, and the other professions? I did get a broader view just because out of my friends that I knew 
that had gone to biz, top business schools, none of them were, that's not true. One of them, a friend of mine who went to MIT Sloan, he went for entrepreneurship, but none of the other ones did. Entrepreneurship was always my focus. So even with those people, I asked them to please put me in contact with someone that, within your network who went to your school for entrepreneurship. And I was very keen in digging through the websites as well. I wanted to see what they had in the way of programs and curriculum. And that's actually one of the things that won me over with Wharton. Because there, there were just so many programs and opportunities that existed for people who wanted to pursue entrepreneurship from the curriculum to you know, certain professors that I wanted to take who are really well known for certain concepts. Like right now, I'm taking um, innovation from Christian Turnweich. That was one of the things that drew me to Wharton, the Venture Initiation Program. Um, that I'm actually applying to in a few weeks when you get money for your startup and you get mentorship. Um, the Venture Award, where you can actually go, instead of getting an internship over the summer, that you get paid to work with your business over the summer, and just the actual network of students outside of that. And so I looked at that for every single school and identified you know, what they had. I wanted to know what they had in the curriculum and, of course, their business plan competition, but I also looked to see what they had beyond that. And I think that no matter what your goal is, you need to really do a deep dive into these schools and see and talk to people who experience these ecosystems beyond the website and really see what they have to offer. What are they delivering? What are they producing as it relates to people who are coming to do what you want to do? Underpinning everything you just said is that you have to know what you want to get out of the MBA. And I think having that goal and mission can really help you, you know, find the right parts of the school website and find the right students to talk to. But what would you advise candidates in terms of showing fit with the school, right? Fit is such a big and important part of the application process. Would you have any tips there? I sure do. Uh, well, for one, I would say don't try to force it because the schools that you're not really a fit for, they're going to sniff that out no matter what. <laughs> the, you have to really respect these admissions committees. I mean, these folks see thousands of applications year in and year out and year in and year out. They've seen it all. They've heard it all. And they have almost a sixth sense for who would fit really well. You know, I really did not enjoy applying to business school, let me tell you. It was grueling, it was a lot of work, it was time consuming, I had no life. But once I got to Wharton, I, I've literally thanked people on the admissions staff for the quality of people that they picked to come here and to be a part of the class that I'm in. Everyone does the research, you gotta do the research, you gotta have kind of a granular idea of what the school has to offer, the culture, kind of how you fit into it. But there has to be a, 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 an additional quality that jumps off of that essay. And it has to be more than just knowing, being able to drop a professor's name or drop a class name or being able to say that you visited. Those are all good things. It's good. It's good to be able to say that you talk to current students. It's good to demonstrate that interest. But I, I really believe that when you really fit into the culture, there will be certain parts of your personality, just who you naturally were, things that you were doing as an undergrad, things you were doing as a middle school student, as a eight-year-old, as a six-year-old, that show that that culture is in you. And I believe for all the schools that I got accepted to, there was something that I was able to talk about that existed before I was even a professional, as a student in college or as a kid growing up, that showed that there was some aspect of my personality that made me a very natural fit for the the type of community that I knew those schools to have, you know. Well, for one, I've always been a person that loved numbers, and every single school that I got into, all three of them was a was a quant, very quant focused school, um, with Wharton and MIT and Booth, and and that that came out from my personality, and 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 the admissions committee I feel felt that, and then that that was a part of the extra quality that came through in my essays beyond the stories that I told demonstrating that fit through the way that I, I really think and things that I've done for a long time and with, above and beyond just simply talking about professors and classes, which is which, which should still be there. But definitely don't think that you express fit because you name professors and classes. Everyone's going to do that. You need something more that's going to make you stand out from the crowd. So in your example, it sounds like you're relating 
a part of your personality that's been with you for a long, long time. Like that's kind of your big tip in terms of matching yourself to the culture or, or I mean, you are a match. What you're trying to say is you are a really good match and your, your way of showing that is that you've exhibited these, this culture or these traits for a long, long time. Right. Yeah. You, you shouldn't have to force the issue. Just be something that you have to remember or unearth. You know, I can remember when I made my video for MIT, one of the things that I talked about that made me a good fit for the school was just some little crappy side projects that I had done that I would never even thought about. When I really pondered it, it really was something that illustrated how, how great of a fit that I was for that particular institution. And I did the same thing with Wharton and I did the same thing with Booth. You did mention that you believe people should not stagnate in their careers and that over 30 applicants really need to show movement in their careers. But that also poses another challenge in terms of tying together all your diverse experiences, you know, starting two different companies, uh, working three different roles with UPS or four different roles, whatever it was. How do you tie that all together when you only have a thousand words to do so? One thing we have to remember is that it's not just about the essays. The essays are important. But I believe that you should use everything in your disposal to paint the picture. And so I actually did not break my neck to tie things together in the essay. In the essay, you really want to focus on answering the question. Doing this whole dramatic arc about some time where you were starving in the middle of Bangladesh, like they don't really care about that as much as people think they do. Really, when it comes to tying your story together, I actually did it on the application. And I'll tell you how. So, you know, you have your resume and it talks about what you've done. And I talked about it in terms of skills. So, for instance, when I went from the online marketing company into UPS, I talked about that I left because I wanted to go and build my, you know, learn how to sell. And that was true. Then when I went from sales into operations, I was doing that because I, I needed to go and learn the core business that drove comp the company revenue. And then I went from operations to engineering because that was an, uh, an opportunity to manage a team for one of the first times and to be able to learn regulatory compliance. And then I went back into sales because I wanted to learn how to deal with larger accounts. And then I left UPS and actually took a pay cut to go to my next job because I wanted to learn how the software development process worked and have that experience and get back into the tech field. And so at every point, even though I was doing things that seemed unrelated, I was able to show that I, I was very purposeful in the skills that I was gaining. And all of those are skills needed to achieve the goal that I talked about and that I still have, uh, which is entrepreneurship within the tech and software space. So it's not so much about Whatever you've done in your career is done, you know, but you have to be able to clearly articulate how each at each step of the way you are gaining skills that were still building you as a professional in the direction um, that you're telling them you want to go as it relates to your goal. Great advice. And what was the hardest part about the application process for, for you? The GMAT was definitely it. Not because the material was so out of this world, but just because just the study regimen was rigorous and very time consuming. It took a lot of discipline. It was very repetitive and boring, um, <laughs> but it had to be done. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and so for those of you listening, you know, Lawrence has this great post on his MBA over 30 site, the laws of getting into a top business school, which I'll definitely link to in the show notes. But, you know, Lawrence, to just sort of wrap up our conversation, I was wondering if you had any last tips for older candidates on applying to top schools? The, the, the main two or three things that I've talked about are, the, are, are pretty much it. I mean, outside of making sure that you're showing that progression and that you understand that more will be expected from you and that you're showing that impact and you know, not aiming for like, like investment banking or some young person's profession, everything else is pretty much the same for an older candidate as it is for everyone else. The schools are looking for the same types of people. They want a diverse group, but they're looking for people who make an impact pretty much wherever they go. And the rules pretty much are the same for everyone, just with those two big caveats as it comes to older candidates. So I would say don't get so don't don't get so caught up in the age because it's not the, it's not the number one thing that they're looking at, I assure you. 
Um, they're looking at your impact, they're looking at your clarity of goals, they're looking at your trajectory, they're looking at whether or not they can help you to meet the goals that you say that they're looking at whether or not they're realistic goals for you. So it's really about the same for you as it is for everyone else. Just remember those two caveats about how to present yourself and, you know, stay out of those one or two booby traps. And, and you've honestly got a shot. I mean, every year there are people within this age group um, that get into school and, and older. I know when I went to go visit Stanford, they had a guy in the class that was about 42 years old. So um, they're, they're there. It's just about packaging yourself properly and just taking it seriously, you know, and respect the fact that, just, that it's been a long time since you've been in a classroom. Respect the fact that it's been a long time since you've taken uh, a standardized test um, or maybe even had to write an essay to, to justify yourself. And just take those things very seriously, put in the time, put in the work, and this is for anyone. And I, I feel that if you really do what you need to do um, and you don't have any major huge glitches in your profile, you, you're going to get in somewhere good that you want to go to. Great stuff. So, you know, I, I think we, we started this podcast as what does it take to get in as an over 30 candidate? But I think the conclusion from our talk is, yeah, it's really pretty much the same process. You know, you really want to show the impact you've made, the results you've achieved, and that you have a clear and real, a realistic career goal. Thank you so much, Lawrence, for your time on the show. And I hope to have you on again to talk about MBAs and startups, because that's another topic our audience would love to hear about. Well, that's another favorite topic of mine, so anytime. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Lawrence. And thank you. Thanks for listening to the Touch MBA podcast. Don't be shy. We have a mailing list. Go to touchmba.com and get yourself signed up. And we'll keep you posted with the best tips and insider interviews on how to get into your number one school. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook at Touch MBA. See you soon.